Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and I'm pleased to once again have uh, Sarah Conrath here. Uh, thanks for joining me again. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, let me just introduce you. Uh, you're an assistant research professor at the Research Center for Group Dynamics at the University of Michigan, and you're a principal investigator of the Interdisciplinary Program on Empathy and altruism research, and it's a lab that's uh, focused on uh, cost and benefits of empathy and related traits and behaviors. And we did a previous uh, extensive uh, interview about your work, and there's a link down here to the page uh, with that, so anyone can uh, follow that link and find out more about you. But what we're here to uh, discuss and just kind of chat about is uh, an article written by Paul Bloom in the May edition of the New Yorker magazine. Um, it's called The Baby in the Well, The Case Against Empathy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's created a bit of a stir, you know, his uh, kind of critical approach uh, to empathy. And uh, you just wrote a response to it in Psychology Today uh, titled Throwing Out the Baby with the Bathwater, Revisiting the Case Against Empathy. Um, so what we want to do is just kind of start a discussion about that. Maybe we can go through part of your article or just have a freestyle discussion about whatever comes up. Um, sure. I wanted to say first that my intention is to build a culture of empathy. Like I'm really for fostering empathy, you know, as far and wide as possible. So just for clarity, that's kind of the position I'm coming from. Kind of wondering where are you coming from uh, on this? Uh, well, I'm hearing that you're saying that's what you're you're looking to um, help to build empathy um, as broadly as possible within our society, and I I come at it personally from that same perspective that I value empathy um, within personal relationships, but also in our society at, at large, um, and I see it as mostly positive. And as a researcher, um, most of the time I'm coming from an overlapping per perspective, but I'm also a, a scientist who would like to know sort of the full picture, and so if there are things to understand about empathy, whether there are costs and benefits, I do want to know that, but still, um, my understanding of it right now is that if there are costs and benefits, the benefits are much more important and they outweigh the costs, but it's good to understand both, I think. Mm -hmm. So you're coming from it, from, it sounds like you're wanting uh, to, you know, foster empathy, but you're also having a science background. So from your science background, you want to kind of study it and have kind of uh, studies to kind of show, you know, how it works and so forth. And you're also looking at kind of how the uh, costs and benefits of being empathic uh, kind of relate, and you're kind of studying that or looking at that. Is that kind of the... That's, yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's um, mostly, I think, my personal perspective and the scientific perspective match, <laughs> that it's it's something that we, as a society, need to foster, um, not uh, like starting from within our own close relationships, even self-empathy and compassion, and moving to the people who maybe we don't know as well and people we don't even ever see, like different parts of the world, um, that it's important that that's, I think, really truly the future of humanity um, so it's a different perspective I think than what Paul Bloom is saying he thinks that um, well I can just actually have the, the article right here but he says that empathy will have to yield to reason if humanity is to have a future but I think um, we need to have more empathy <laughs> if mm -hmm. we want to have a future yeah, so you're coming from the position that we need to foster empathy and have more empathy for our future. If we want to even have a future, that if we don't have empathy, it's kind of sad like you think we might not even have a future. I think that it's a key to um, helping us survive because each of the interactions that we have that are empathetic can help to build like larger interactions in communities and schools and then also in our society and internationally, ultimately, um, across borders. Um, I, I do believe that it's fundamental to relating. And if we have empathy even for our future generations, we will be careful with how we use resources, and um, there is there are sort of future implications of us having widespread empathy. Uh -huh. So you're feeling that it kind of the empathy is, you're looking at empathy kind of with closer relationships, and that will kind of like 
ripple out? Is that kind of the, what you're meaning in terms of ripple out to the future, thinking of the future and thinking of other people? Yeah, that's how I, I do think it does start sort of very close within, uh, you know, the closest relationships we have as parents and children and our, like, you know, loved ones, spouses, friends. Um, I think that's how it probably was evolved. But that um, in modern societies, we have the ability to empathize very widely with people we've never even met who live in a place we've never even imagined, um, who, who experience things that um, we can try to imagine with, through our empathy. And I think of it as um, not just an emotional experience, but also it's a cognitive skill. So we can, it takes actually some intelligence and some reasoning ability to get inside somebody else's mind and to see their perspective. Yeah, well, 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 speaking to getting into someone else's mind, you know, I think about this, like, you know, Paul Bloom says, uh, you know, we, you know, empathy has got all these problems, you know, we need less of it or whatever. And, you know, I can say, no, you're wrong and kind of want to fight with him about it and argue with him. But then, you know, I really want to take an empathic approach to the dialogue about, uh, you know, talking with him. So the first thing I did was invite him to a dialogue uh, you know, and, and I said, I, all I want to do is empathically listen to you and empathically understand uh, where you're coming from. And he said, well, I'm pretty busy right now, but I checked out your website. looks pretty good. He was kind of impressed. He said, in two months, I can probably do it in July. So I'm hoping to have a, you know, a real oh, sit down dialogue, you know, and then to really to approach it in an empathic way to really hear where he's coming from. So um, yeah. sometimes even academics, right, they can say, well, this is my position. It also becomes like a fight between academics about who's right and wrong. And so it's kind of done in a competitive yes, yes, way. And, <laughs> you know. I really like that approach. <laughs> it's nice. So I'm hearing that you really are trying to, even though you may have some disagreements, that you're trying to understand where he's coming from and wanting to listen to his opinion and respect it. Yeah, right? uh -huh. really understand it and, and really, and really yeah. to model the empathy, you know, how do I kind of model or how do we model empathy with them and, and uh, so, yeah, so that, that's, any, that's one, you know, kind of one approach, so. Um, that's a good approach. I think maybe my approach was not as empathetic as it could be. I mean, I, I use a typical academic style, so kind of like refuting points as I saw them. Uh, I did try to, in my blog, um, article, I tried to at least give direct quotes from the article, from his own article, so it's kind of like trying to say this is what he said, here's his perspective, but I think it's much, it would be much better actually just to have a real, true back and forth dialogue, it's more fair. Uh -huh. so yes, nice. yeah, so yeah, you're saying that a dialogue then is kind of even easier or more, there's more of a fairness of both sides kind of hearing each other. And the, and the academic style, I guess, is a little bit, somebody made a point and then you kind of create the counterpoint and, and you're kind of like using maybe studies, like, you know, he's kind of referring to different studies and so forth and then making these points and then you kind of make counterpoints and, and but that's kind of how things work though too. And Yeah, I mean, it can be done in a way that's considerate, you know, like it doesn't have to be um, attacking or negative. And overall, actually, I was really appreciative of his article. Um, I think it did make people like, talk about these issues and debate these issues. It's very good to have this, this kind of dialogue. Um, and it's also something that usually, most of the time, I think reflexively, most people right away immediately believe that empathy is just like good, like it's not even questioned. Um, so if we want to build something, in our culture, we need to know sort of a bit more about it. Um, and I think I have some disagreements with the negative things that he said about empathy, but in general, there might be some parts of empathy that aren't, or that we should at least consider if we're going to try to build a culture of empathy. Mm. So what I'm kind of hearing is that, uh, that you're wanting to foster empathy, but you find it good to hear kind of like the criticism of empathy because it makes you kind of question and look at what you're doing and then you can kind of hear where, you know, where he's coming from, where his concerns are, and it gives you something to kind of work with. And then um, maybe there's some kind of validity to, you know, what he's saying. And, that it, and it sounds like it creates a stronger foundation 
maybe for yes. empathy as well because you've kind of looked into it more deeply and and heard all the different uh, inputs uh, maybe about it. Yeah, definitely. And so I think it's also important that uh, we wouldn't, as in building the culture of empathy, we want to make sure, I think the motivation behind it is empathic, that we want the society to be better and more connected, um, happier. We want to make sure that there aren't going to be some negative side effects that we didn't think about. It, it seems really silly when you think about it, because empathy is like, so good, but <laughs> I, don't know. I, I really do appreciate what he did. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, at least, at least we're talking about it. Yeah, and so you you have some appre actual appreciation for his work and bringing that up and creating this dialogue and giving us something to work with and to think about and yeah. that it kind of stimulates a dialogue and some thought about it and brings it up into our awareness. That's actually one of the things I'd heard about. How do we create a culture of empathy? You know, I asked people that and they said, create a dialogue about it. You know, get people talking oh. about it, thinking about it. So in a sense, he's kind of like creating a it's helped stimulate a, a dialogue uh, around it. So right. it maybe even is helping to build a culture of yeah. empathy. That's wonderful. Yeah, it does sound that he's that he's he's helping to do it, and um, it's great that the New Yorker wants to cover this content. It's not their typical type of you know story. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to see that. Yeah. Well, I felt a little combative about it myself. My first, yeah, well, you know, I, I talked to people like uh, Helen Reese from, she's at, at uh, you know, Harvard has a center there for, and she said what her concern was is that, you know, what people will see is they're not going to go into the details of the article. What they're going to see is empathy is bad. And then suddenly yeah. everybody starts piling on empathy is bad, empathy is bad. And she was really concerned that, you know, you know, most people, it's, it's going to roll off their backs, kind of, you know, that, you know, but that it'll be like in the schools, administrators, uh, you know, people like that who are policymakers, they're going to see what the national tone is. And if empathy is seen as bad, they're going to say, uh oh, I'm not going to implement empathy in my school oh, program. Yeah. And so it's going to. Yeah, in wow. Yeah, I can, I can see that as a big concern, actually. Um, you're right that you and I and, and, and also Helen Reese, we spend a lot of our time thinking about this stuff and writing about it and talking about it. And, you know, we're really getting into it. But, you're, but yeah, I think that the average person um, who reads the article might just be like, okay, take home point, empathy's bad. Mm -hmm. And that can have some serious implications. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. And so maybe it's good you kind of come up with some of the science that mm -hmm. says, hey, you know, this point is not quite accurate. And well, it's still I still see it as a dialogue. So I'm, uh -huh. you know, I'm speaking, I, I'm I'm looking at the research I know, and I'm posting it out there so people can look at it for themselves and they can respond. And you know, maybe he'll also respond at some point um, and maybe refute the points that I've put up there. But I, I just think someone. You know, I'm, I'm really glad, actually, that you're paying attention to this because um, those potential harmful consequences are important. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that you're spending a lot of time on this. So, so um, should we go through maybe your articles, some of the points? Because I'd love to actually discuss some of the points that you came up with, you know, that okay. because, because I'd like to kind of add my angle as well as, you yes. know, hear your angle to it because I have okay. some real... Um, yeah, so do you want to just start with your article, like kind of what you're, you basically start saying, you know, quoting his comment about em empathy is parochial, narrow-minded, and numerate. We're often at our best when we're smart enough not to rely on it. And besides that, I love your title, uh, you know, throwing the baby uh, out with the, what was it? Um, with the bathwater. <laughs> with the bathwater. I mean, it's so appropriate somehow. Well, it started with the baby in the well, and uh -huh. I'm a mom with the baby, so I can't help but <laughs> put that in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I thought the, the thing is, when I was reading the article, one of the problems I had, I read it a few times, and one of the problems I had was trying to understand sort of like, what's, what's the core here of the overall point of what he's saying? Because he does have a lot of very interesting cases, and it's very good writing. It's quite interesting to read. Um, but when I kind of step back a bit, I thought, what he's sort of saying, I think, maybe I'm misinterpreting, but I'm hearing that he was saying sort of what does empathy look like in the extreme if we remove like logic from empathy. Um, 
And I think that that's, if that's really what he's asking, then that's a problem. So I'm curious to know what you think about what he's saying overall. Uh -huh. So you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is that he is kind of taking an extreme, kind of looking at it at the extreme and saying what happens when you remove logic uh, from empathy and you have only empathy uh, without uh, logic. And I think he's actually using the word reasoning. Yeah, reasoning, yes. And that you're also saying, I'm hearing that he's, you feel he's a very good writer. So he's very, yes. yeah, he, he does, he's a good writer and that uh, it's kind of entertaining to read his writing too. You're, so, what do you think were his? Do you think, or do you think that that was his point? Yeah, or what did you for, think from it? Yeah, for me, it was it was always kind of like uh, here's empathy. You know, I mean, empathy is geared towards you know one direction and it inhibits others. Okay. It, it's not directed at others. So I'm. It's like it's it's kind of it's like it's kind of like the same story over and over again. And I was kind of seeing it's kind of like the judge. The judge is having empathy for one person and not the other, so right. empathy is bad. The uh, you know he didn't use this story, but the the you know the Nazi um, you know concentration camp uh, guard is you know brutal to his uh, you know to the people, the inmates. He goes home. He has a loving family. You know he loves his wife and the dog and. And family, so empathy is bad because he's having empathy for his his, his family, and he's not having empathy, and it's all empathy's fault. Then it's like uh, the judge is having empathy for one person; he's not having it for everybody else. So empathy is bad, and so it's kind of like this. This this kind of gets repeated uh, for me, at least, over and over again. And kind of my response to that is, well, let's expand the empathy. You know, let's let's have the empathy so that. We start with where we are with empathy, and then we extend it to all parts and all sections of life, and uh, yeah. so that's kind of the core for me. So it's like this idea you're saying that he, you think that he's saying that um, empathy is bad because it's so specific to only the closest others we have, and then therefore the, uh, the people who are less close can't receive our empathy. Yeah, in a sense. But that maybe we just need to expand who we empathize with. That's what my approach, his approach is. Let's you know, let's use something else in that space where empathy isn't that, and that's that that something is something called reason, which you know, he hasn't really explained what that really even is. It seems to me. Yeah. I don't. At least I don't hear it. I don't. Do you hear it? Or? I didn't. I didn't quite see that either. But I, and and also what I didn't see was the sort of the other extreme of the argument, which is what does reason look without empathy? Yeah. Right. So this. There's sort of the two, there's the empathy without reason, there's the empathy uh, applied only to the closest people in your life, or the only specific people and not others, and then there's this idea of what's reason without yeah. empathy, and do we want that? Is that really truly what we want for our moral decision making? Yeah, it, and it's the reason, I mean, for me, the, that reasoning, you could say that, the, you know, the the fascism, the Nazi fascism, was all about reason. It was extreme reasoned efficiency in terms of being unempathic towards other people. And the you know the goal was you know we are right in our what we're doing. There was a sense of rightness, but it was totally unempathic to you know millions and millions and millions of people. So if that's the kind of reasoning that that we want, um, it's not what I support. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's also, there's, a, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go, you go. Oh, there was just one more thing. I was kind of like, you know, I kind of thought it was like, I had a metaphor come up for this. Yeah. And it's like, you're, you're in the desert and it's like, you're hot and dry and thirsty. Your lips are parched. And it's like, there's just no water. It's the Sahara desert and you're in total pain and suffering. And then you, you find the canteen. Right, and it's like I'm wanting water. I'm wanting water. You find a canteen, and there's a little drops of water, and you drink it, and it's like, oh, I'm still thirsty. I'm still hot. I'm still suffering. It's the water's fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it's like it's That's almost really it's almost like I call it. Uh, it's like empathic delirium, right? You're in this state of almost like you know heat delirium you know, suffering delirium, and then you say that it's the thing that can actually save you, the water that's at fault. And for me, the idea is instead of doing that, it's like let's 
create an environment where we have an oasis, a spring, where we bathe in empathy, you know, and, and, and so forth. So that's, that's actually kind of just a metaphor that kind of came up for me around this. Lovely. Really lovely. And these environments, I, I think they exist. I mean, they're, they're rare, but you, everyone has a, a choice to try to create them. And when you're also, when you're in the environment, it just, it doesn't work so well when you try the non-empathic strategy <laughs> because all you get are a bunch of people empathizing. <laughs> so it just takes away that energy um, that you might have. You know, I didn't quite get that. that if you're in an if you're in an environment that's a non-empathic environment, or an yeah. empathic environment, or non-empathic. Oh, I'm saying if you're in, no, I'm sorry. I'm saying if you're in an empathic environment, like this beautiful oasis that you describe, um, that, and this is we're just I'm just going like off topic here, but just thinking about what it would be like to actually have a culture where people mm. are really valuing this and trying. So obviously, none of us are perfect, and we're gonna mess up once in a while. But if the whole culture is supporting this then when we're not acting empathetically, I mean, the usual response in a non-empathetic culture is you get attacked. If you do something mean, you get mean back. But in an empathetic culture, when you do something mean, because there's all these empathetic people surrounding you. Yeah. It and it takes away the motivation to keep being mean. Yeah, they would be hearing you. They'd be saying, well, we're hearing that there's something wrong here. What is it? You know, they would, yeah. So you would feel heard about what it is because there's probably something irritating you, bothering you, and you need to be heard about it. And yeah. you'd have a whole environment uh, kind of hearing you and kind of being there kind of for you. So I was at an interesting conference recently where this, this I got to feel sort of what this feels like, even in a, you know intellectual environment. It was the Roots of Empathy conference oh, in Toronto wow. uh -huh. a couple of weeks ago, or I guess it was maybe three weeks ago. Um, but it was wonderful. Um, Mary Gordon, I think you know her. Work. Yeah. So she has this philosophy of holding these research symposiums in which we can be critical thinkers and use our logic and reason and everything like that. But when it comes to sort of questioning, you know, like putting up our hands and asking questions, it's not the typical academic approach. It's not the sort of like pulling out the guns and shooting somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's more of this very empathetic. It's reflective. Um, this is what I heard you say. Did I hear you right? Okay, well, this is what I felt. What do you think? And it just really, you can go so much deeper intellectually in some of these issues when you remove, like, the stress and defensiveness that comes with, um, like, a low empathy culture. Yeah, so I'm just reflecting, what I was saying, you went to a, I'll just do the, the empathic listening. That's what we do in our empathy circles, too. And that's what I actually would like to do with Paul Bloom and actually Steven Pinker, is to have an empathy circle with them in the sense that we have like an empathic environment and an empathic dialogue where each person kind of shares their experience and then their heard, reflected, the other person reflects um or restates what they're what they heard to the satisfaction of the speaker till the speaker feels that they've been totally understood and that's kind of what i was hearing the environment that the that uh, mary gordon is setting up is kind of like a environment of that if, if someone speaks that they are fully heard by others until they are have nothing else to say until they've been understood by everyone in the uh in the group or the circle, and then it's the next person's turn to speak, and that way is that sense of, of having that sense of being fully heard, and so that sounds like it kind of resonated with your experience. Well, it was pretty you. amazing because it was in the context of a research symposium, so it's a time when we are debating all these issues where we had many disagreements in terms of, like, what's the definition of empathy, and, like, even how to interpret, like, research studies, and, you know, and so on, the usual things that would come up, but... It was just done in this way that was very, I thought, it was unusual, but it was it ultimately had a really positive effect in terms mm. of the outcome that we want, which is, as scholars, to have, like, sort of a deeper understanding of our topic. So mm. I think it would be great if you were able to do a dialogue with Paul Bloom and Stephen mm -hmm. Baker. So do that kind of, so this is like an environment which is like an academic environment that you kind of created a different, where everyone's kind of talking about their research and their work and their studies 
and it's where people are really being heard and heard deeply and you're finding that it's actually was in some ways even working better in terms of the uh, the research the exploration became even deeper yes and and I think that that's an important point when it comes to this essay the baby in the well because I think what he's kind of saying if I'm I hope I'm hearing him but maybe he can respond but I think what he's saying is that um, it might if we're empathetic that might affect our ability to reason properly um, and I'm saying that maybe that's not the case that mm -hmm. maybe it's possible to be empathetic and I and have very good reasoning skills and maybe being empathetic helps us to reason mm -hmm. so you're you're saying if I just kind of reflect here that if he that you're seeing you you think that he's saying that if we're empathic we're not going to be able to reason that there's a they in they inhibit each other and that um, you're saying that they they don't that they actually might assist each other they might yeah uh -huh. I mean what do you think of that, of that idea um, yeah, about reason. It depends on what reason, what you call reason. Um, there's, you know, there is no definition of reason, so I'm a bit, uh, I'm not sure what he means by reason. There's a type of reasoning in terms of how our mind actually does reason, sort of by association, that if, um, you know, if I, as a child, uh, you know, I'm with in the kitchen with my mother, uh, she's baking cookies, there's a smell of cookies, it's a warm day, I have this sense of anticipation of I'm going to get a cookie, you know, at the end of this, and there's this sense of love and care. And so all those associations get kind of made in the brain, you know, all those things get linked together. And then, you know, sometime now I, I smell cookies, and then suddenly all those experiences come flooding back into my, into my mind. So that's kind of like for me, is that reason? I mean, that's kind of like a that's reasoning, like how these different experiences get <clears throat> linked together. <clears throat> so it's kind of like, or do you mean reason, kind of like some kind of logic or something? I'm not really sure. Or analysis, how we're trying to analyze each other. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> So you're saying that this is a, there's a problem with that uh, definition of, of reason, and I mean, and that um, maybe you can think of reasoning as something like, um, linked with emotional experiences, memories, and things like that. You can also think about it as this like formal, logical type of step-by-step -step reasoning, whatever, yeah. or analytical <clears throat> type of ability. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm just not sure how he's really meaning it. I don't yeah. know what he means by reasoning. There are some studies about, like if I'm listening to you and trying to empathize with you and hear you, I can start step back and start analyzing you. Oh, you're a researcher, you're this, you're that, you know, I'm analyzing you. And as I understand that analysis can inhibit empathy because you're kind of pulling yourself out and trying to mm -hmm. analyze. So is that, you know, so I'm not really sure what he means by, is it that that he's talking about analysis or? Oh, I see what you mean. So you're saying like that's different than the step-by-step -step logic, like that type of stepping back and uh, analyzing a person. Yeah, it's if you're, it's kind of like the the therapist. You know, you're on the yeah. therapist, and they'll use a little bit of empathy to kind of hear who you are. But then they'll say, "Ah, oh, this is your mother. When you were a child, your mother did this to you, and you have these complexes. And I understand what had happened. And here's the prescription for that. And <laughs> and uh, you know, that doesn't sound very empathetic." <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it sounds like the opposite. I mean, that's sort of distancing. So it's kind yeah. Of like, even when you when you um, started sort of mimicking what it would be like to be analytical like that, you actually physically moved your body backward. It's almost like, uh, it's like I don't know. I don't know if it's whatever, but it seems like it's not as um, it's not going to work with empathy. But I think that's different than the idea of just like, can you be like a rational, logical? human being, which I, I think he's using reasoning that way. Uh-huh. Um, the, the classical, um, you know, I don't even know how to describe it. But this idea, well, the, you know, like numbers, having being able to reason about numbers and statistics and um, being able to think carefully about arguments. Um, it seems to me that many of his points had to do with 
like that empathy might make us less able to do these things. So. Mm -hmm. so you're saying you were saying it to begin with with the uh, when I was starting to do the analysis I was even moving back and you're <laughs> you're kind of getting this visceral sense of of distancing you know yeah. from our connection and then you're saying that uh, there's something about uh, I wasn't quite that that maybe he was that maybe Paul is seeing um, empathy or or logic about reasoning about thing I wasn't quite. What I'm saying is I'm agreeing with you that there doesn't seem to be a clear definition of, of reasoning um, and what it actually means, but my guess from what I'm reading is that he thinks it means this like traditional sense, not necessarily like being analytic in the sort of therapy way, mm -hmm. but being analytic in the kind of, you know, like college student way, like, <laughs> you know, reading information, organizing it, categorizing it, you know, understanding numbers, some of that, uh, the stuff you'd be tested on on like the GRE or something. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> so know. he's maybe using empathy, I mean uh, reason is something just kind of kind of uh, organizing information, uh, yeah. you know, structuring it, giving form and structure to it, and that that would not be, you know, that would be something different from empathy. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's I think that's what his argument is. But um, but my one of the things that I had that I thought in response to what he said was that I wasn't sure if it really truly represented like the state of like research. So I kind of I went through a few of his points. I didn't go through like point by point or anything, but a few of his points that I thought were the big ones, and tried to see if they really truly reflected what I understood the current research to be. And I mean. I think most of them, I didn't really see that. Um, so one example is the identifiable victim effect, which uh, I should probably at least define because it's not an obvious thing. But this is the tendency when, um, when you see a single person who has a name, you know, and this person needs help, you're more likely to want to help this person than when you say, like, see, a, you hear about like 2,000 people unnamed people who need help. So, I mean, you should be more likely, you should want to help the 2,000 people. There's more people, so then they need more help. But the research finds that you people tend to want to help just that single individual more. Mm -hmm. And like, clearly that's, I agree with him that it's not a, it's not the greatest thing. You should try to help the people. <laughs> if there's more people who need help, then there should be more help given to them. But um, but he okay, can, can I just thought. reflect so far what I'm hearing oh, so far? Sure. So what you're saying is that um, he's made some kind of assertions about different things. One of them was the identifiable victim effect. And, and he's kind of like basing this on some kind of scientific studies and so forth. And then you're kind of looking at that and kind of looking at what is, what is your experience with how you see in the studies of how the uh, identifiable victim effect kind of works. And you're looking at the studies that are out there around it. And with that, that if that with the, the way that that's kind of explained is that there's one person that you're kind of in direct contact with, you have more empathy with them uh, versus uh, if there's like 200 people that you don't see that you have less empathy for them. And so, it's like uh, empathy is kind of like uh, geared more towards someone who you can see directly versus towards all these others who you don't have like direct contact with. Yeah, so that's actually that's Paul's uh, criticism. So he that that the fact that he said that empathy makes us that, that that the reason why this effect exists, the identifiable victim effect, is because we empathize, we feel com concern and compassion for that one person, and it's unfair because we should feel concern and compassion equally for mm. all the people. Mm -hmm. And and I think if that point were supported by research, I would, I would agree um, that it would be unfair to feel more empathy for, um, for this one particular person just because we know her name or we could see a picture of her compared to these, you know, numerous other people who are suffering equally. Um, but at least the study that I found that was by the same authors that he mentioned um, didn't find that there, they actually measured empathetic responses in each of those circumstances. So the single person who's named 
versus the group of people. Um, and they found that there were no differences in people's emotional responses of compassion and care. When they heard about the group who were suffering, they felt the same amount of compassion and care, or what we call empathic concern, um, for the group as they did for that individual person. But there was a difference in emotional responses. The people who um, see just that single person who's named and who's suffering, what they feel is more self-related distress. So I feel sad, I feel upset um, when they see this individual. And that tells me that this is not caused by empathy, actually. Mm -hmm. This is caused by a, a personal distress response, which is seen in the literature as a self-focused emotional response. And it's just because people respond emotionally to something doesn't mean it's empathy. Oh, uh, okay. So let me see. So with, uh, with the identical victim effect, uh, Paul is saying, well, here's this person that you hear about directly, and here are these other people that you're not hearing about. And that, you know, it's kind of unfair that you think more about this person and, and not about the others. So there's a lack of fairness or something within that. And that you're looking at the studies, that the studies didn't necessarily say that there's less empathy for both sides that they're, the one that you know directly about, that you have a sense of personal distress about that, which is not empathy, that's really more like sympathy or, or your, own, your own distress about it. You're not being empathic. Uh, that, but that the, in the study, it actually shows that there was kind of like equal amount of empathy for both yeah. sides. And so it's really not empathy that was kind of the problem in that situation. It was that personal distress or that, I'm adding to this, but... It's that yeah, no, sympathy no. or other other stuff that's going on, like your own fear and anxiety and so forth. That's that's really the emotions that are coming up. Yeah, that that seeing these when you when you get this you know photograph of this individual with this name and you hear about their case, that specific case, it makes you feel like pretty bad. It makes you feel pretty terrible. Um, personally, you just it, it riles it gets people feeling upset, worried, disturbed, but it's not lowering your, it's, it's not making you feel more empathetic specifically, because when you hear about the 2,000 people who are suffering but don't have names, who maybe also went through this recent earthquake or whatever was going on in the story, um, you feel just as much compassion for those people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the identifiable victim effect is really cool, but, you know, as, as you know, you don't need identifi identifiable victims to start helping have a compassionate helping response when you hear about an earthquake in India or somewhere like you there's there can still be compassion um, for various reasons and an and empathetic imagination of what it might be like for the people there who are suffering whether you know their names or faces mm -hmm. so that you're able to actually go into a kind of imaginative empathy and imagine what it would be like if there was some kind of a catastrophe overseas and that you could you can kind of imagine what it's like uh, to be in that situation and you don't have to have just the identifiable person there. You can kind of imagine the whole community or the whole group and maybe what they're going through. Yeah, so I mean at least that's my understanding of the research. So maybe there's something I'm oh, missing. Uh -huh. But anyway. But. Yeah. So that's what the, the research is not saying that it's the empathy. It's that there's the emotional part of it is, I'm using the word sympathy. Does that seem to would that be that like you're sympathizing? Because that's even in, in the psychology literature so much about, you know, you empathize and then you feel sorry for the person or it's like, oh, I feel bad. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like your mother died. Well, I remember when my mother died, yeah. right? And I'm all upset because I remember my mother dying. Let me right. tell you about my mother. So that's not, you've shifted out of the empathy and you've gone into your own self, you know, emotions that are going on with with you and you kind of need empathy yourself at that point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think that I, I mean I don't know about the word sympathy because it's there's so many different ways to define that word mm -hmm. uh, but I agree with your definition of just that what's happened regardless of what you call it whether it's sympathy or personal distress is that there the people are hearing about that individual person who's suffering and then they're going okay wow well, that, that this is how it affects me and then oftentimes what happens is we try to alleviate our own feelings of distress by giving. Yeah. It kind of makes us feel better. But that's sort of a self-related reason to give rather than going, okay, I'm going to give because this person needs something. Yeah. 
So it's separating that sense of what the motivation is for contributing to and One or you're contributing, if it's out of empathy, it's more having a deeper connection, sense of connection with the person you're wanting to, you know, contribute to their welfare. The other is just to kind of relieve your own internal agony or suffering or whatever about the situation. And, and they're kind of like different kind of ways of being. Yeah. And that's just based on a study by the same... Um researchers that were mentioned in his article. So, I mean, we don't have to get into every, like, point of his article if there's no time, but just, um, that's kind of what I did with this response article, was just trying to figure out what were her, his main points and whether, and what the research says, you know, about those types of points. Um, so. Yeah, because he's making kind of a scientific assertion here, like, here's this study this is my take on it. This study is showing empathy is is bad, and you're kind of like saying, well, it's kind of more complicated than that. That the assertions you're making aren't actually quite accurate in the sense of what even what the researchers themselves were saying. Yeah, and I think that that brings us back to Helen Reese's point, which is that there's not many people who are gonna deeply like investigate each of the points that are in his article. It's it is entertaining. It's quite a nice read and. Most of us, when we're reading the New Yorker, if we read it, it's very fun. But we put it down when we're done, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the end. And uh, some of us people decide that we're, gonna, you know, like get more into it. Mm -hmm. like, but it's most most people just read it for entertainment, and then the, the take-home point is going to be, well, empathy is bad because you empathize more for this poor individual than you do for the group of individuals who needs your help just as much. Um, but that's not the my point is it's that's not accurate in terms of what we know if we're using research evidence. Mm. So you're saying that you're wanting, if, if he's making kind of research assertions, <clears throat> that you're kind of looking at the kind of the evidence about really what is the underlying part, and you're also recognizing that part that, you know, most people don't go into this minute detail like you and, <laughs> you and I to the subtleties and all that. They don't have time. They got lives and jobs. <laughs> And all they hear about is empathy is bad, and and uh, they they doubt. They don't know. It's like you know, yeah, yeah. I had some thoughts on yeah. on this. Um, I'd love the to one hear. thing is within these uh, identifiable victim effect is like a lot of times the the basic uh, point is kind of structured has a certain structure to it. Like oh, I got these people, these people. But for me, I kind of look at how do we build a culture of empathy. So in the terms of, of if there's a catastrophe overseas, the question is, is how do I maximize empathy in that environment? And that's like going, you know, in through history, you know, the present and you know, in the past, maybe if we had done more in terms of fostering a culture of empathy, you know, the effects of kind, some kind of a catastrophe might have been less or we, or we might have headed off a, a Rwanda or the killing fields of, uh, you know, Cambodia. And so it's kind of these studies is kind of like here and now in this situation, and it doesn't bring in kind of this value of empathy and kind of our lack of not having made it a, a primary social value. Because if we had made it a primary social value, it would have changed the whole dynamics of this study yeah. in a sense. Right. So let me see if I can try this one, because this one I think is what, what you're saying is complex, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So, and please correct me, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to make sure I really have it, that when we're running studies like the type that you'd see in the identifiable victim effect, um, there's something artificial about it, because it's in a lab setting, and it doesn't really represent this like real situation that happens in cultures, and that's important to consider, because when you're if we had a culture of empathy overall, when you would be considering those situations of tragedies occurring all over the place, they, we would have actually altered the way they turned out. They wouldn't have necessarily been as severe as they ended up being because we don't have the culture of empathy that we want. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or what am I missing? Uh, uh, that's part of it, yeah. They but wouldn't be as severe. And, and also, it's a sense that... I, I'm kind of like, you know, this is kind of at the edge of my own kind of awareness or something, my own understanding too, is that, um, one, we would have been trained in how to empathize for both people, right? We would be yeah. understanding. We would have been educated 
in our empathy for how to deal with that situation to begin with. Plus, it wouldn't be just me saying, oh, those poor people over there. Yeah. I would be saying, I hope that I want to foster. It's not just I want to give some money or something to them. It's I want to create an empathic culture with them as well um, in the sense that, uh, you know, if it's some – it's yeah so there's the artificiality that you're kind of talking about but it seems like there's like a bigger issue that if we had an empathic culture you know in all those places instead of seeing us and them over there yeah. it would be us okay. you know there's a real there's a real individualism in all these kind of studies in a sense it's us the rich you know people we're going to help the poor over there which is already becoming it's already kind of framing it in sympathy, you know, even, or, you know, that self, you know, my own problem. It's not framed in the sense of a culture, fostering a culture, an empathic culture between us all and between okay. the people over there. So it's something along those lines, I guess. So something like when you're saying you want to foster an empathic culture, you're not talking about an empathic culture in the United States. You're talking about you want a global, interconnected, empathic civilization in which the things that are affecting people in other countries are affecting us too because yeah. there's, there's, yeah. there's a bigger weed there's not just look at what's happening over there across the ocean or look at what's happening over there in somewhere else in the states but we we understand that we're all interconnected and that everything that's happening to you is happening to me and there's not really a you and me it's more of an us is that yeah you? yeah yeah that's more it that's very cool that's very visionary actually <laughs> 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 so so that's so that's something very different because that framing that you brought up actually is something that I think to my knowledge I don't think we've really paid attention to that in our research I think we generally have the assumption that there is an us as in people in our culture specifically United States or Canada or whatever um, and then helping the them, yeah, the, the, whoever those they those thems are in these other cultures. But you're right that I think that there's artificiality that you get. It's not just the lab setting, but it's the artificial distinction between like us and them. Yeah, and that, that us and them actually is un, unempathic in its nature. So we're kind of like we're kind of stacking the deck in an unempathic way. In, in how we're already looking at the whole study in a sense versus it's all yeah. us you know we're all we're all it, it's just taking the empathy as the as the default position instead of a selfish self uh, position as the default position i mean i'm just thinking like how would i design research studies following up with where your idea of what if we take empathy as a default yeah and not this individual self like how would we design research studies differently yeah, exactly. What wow. would that look like? Yeah. So you're saying that difference, the difference in in the the premises. You're saying, and how do you create a, a different uh, studies that kind of start with those kind of premises? That is really cool. I mean, it's something that I think as, because I'm so used to this research literature, I never even would have saw, seen that. And noticed that the framing of it was so off. Yeah. Uh, it is something that Dan Batson has written extensively about. Like, what are some potential obviously benefits of empathy, he thinks that there's a lot of benefits in terms of making us widen our sense of self and you can, you know, empathize with like like any person anywhere and that will make you want to care and connect with them. But he also has tried to understand what are potential liabilities of it. And I mean he thinks that it's maybe like that maybe and now this maybe you will disagree with, but he thinks that maybe empathy itself can make us paternalistic. So it's like, you know, like I think what Maybe let me backtrack. Were you saying that the studies are a bit paternalistic in the sense that they yeah um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. They kind of frame us as the powerful ones who then can give our resources to the less powerful? Yeah, I think there's part of that is it's between us and them, but it's a, it is but has a paternalistic uh, quality to it. And in fact, I had a, when I interviewed uh, Dan and. Uh, you know, we were talking, and I asked him about uh, Carl Rogers, who's kind of a real, I'm kind of following really in, in his empathic listening, empathic way of being kind of thread. And he said, well, you know, uh, Carl Rogers would actually say my approach is paternalistic. <laughs> <laughs> So 
so it's interesting that you that you that that guy that you brought that term up. So well, yeah, he, but I actually brought that up from his own writing. It's a chapter he's written on what are some potential liabilities of empathy, and I think that he's he's aware of his own research, um, like the limitations there, and he says he thinks that one of the limitations is that when you empathize with somebody, when you put by empathizing with them, you might be put in a state of some superiority or something that you you feel like you, like you're the actor who's then you know better than them in some way because yeah. you have the power to do that and then um I don't know if it's you know I don't know if the evidence for it is but that's what he argues might be one potential liability uh -huh. so uh, the liability that you're hearing that he's uh, referring to is that when you're empathizing someone and they're kind of in a worse shape than you that yeah. that's, that sense of seeing them in that position might be paternalistic in the sense that you think that you need to do something for them uh, and then you kind of create this paternalistic uh, quality uh, to it. Yeah, that's, that's what I think he's saying, but, but yeah. something doesn't sit right with me, but I can't quite articulate it. And I'm, I'm curious to know what you think of that, because for, for now when I hear that I go, oh, maybe that is a real legitimate critique of empathy, but well, the approach that uh, Carl Rogers did was, is all I'm here to do is hear you, you know, and it's like, it, it's, but it's being present, being present with the person, hearing them to the full extent that they need to be heard, and that through that, that presence and that being able to see themselves reflected, that they kind of discover kind of the answer within themselves is kind of one aspect. But I think the other one is it's also mutual empathy. It's like a culture of empathy is not me just empathizing with you. It's like what we're doing, like I'm reflecting, hearing what you're saying, but I'm wanting a culture of empathy, so I am advocating for you hearing me too, and that we do the mutual hearing until we come, we come to this point where we kind of have this mutual agreement about what it is, what the action is going to be. And in that point, there's a it kind of takes the paternalism out because it's just us working together on kind of solving the problem. Okay, so that there, there might be some circumstances where, well, even in the therapeutic circumstance you're saying that it's not that the, first, the therapist is trying to have, be powerful or do something to make the, the client's life better, they're just trying to listen and that there might be some healing in the reflection, but if you can use that that same skill within a relationship, you can actually have a better mutual back and forth empathetic connection. Yeah, and that's how to build a culture of empathy. Yeah, that mutual that mutual relationship is the building of that culture of empathy because we're we're working, we're actually doing it. You know, we say we 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 have the intention that we want a culture of empathy, and then we actually do it by empathizing with each other. That's exactly uh, and, and, like what Mary Gordon was doing. What I was trying to say about Mary Gordon was that she really does, you can see she tries really hard, um, not only in her personal interactions, but in her, the way she set up her organization to actually not just, you know, have babies come into a classroom and make the students more empathetic, but to build that culture of empathy right within her organization. Um, and you can just interacting with her a few weeks ago was very neat to see this. It wasn't just her too. Like you could see, like her staff really. It's part of the culture there, and mm -hmm. I think that it's really. I yeah, think so that answers that oh, question. Yeah. So, so you're I, saying that your experience. This is kind of what we're talking about. Is re, kind of coming to your experience of being at the conference with Mary Gordon, in that she's really trying to create a whole culture, that kind of empathic culture, not just with the the children, but actually in the relationships of all the people uh, involved in her staff. And you could really feel the uh, the empathic environment that she was creating. And it sounds like that was kind of like resonating. Uh, something about that uh, that you were really noticing that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That it was cool. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> but I know that you had a student. You had an appointment. I don't want to keep you over. I do in a, in a few minutes. So yeah, I'm I can go to... on and on for hours so, about you know, this stuff. You know, I find it so. Time, we can do this. <laughs> and I do want to join one of your empathy circles. I just um, I have to. I probably have to plan it because my kids' uh, daycare is right around the time it ends. It ends at five thirty. Uh, Eastern time, yeah, it's right? 1 p.m., which is going to be 1, 2, yeah, 3 to uh, about 5. Uh -huh. 
uh, Eastern. Five. Uh huh. Oh, three or, to five. Your your time, right? It's one o'clock, and then one, two, three, four. Oh, it's four till six. That's right. Okay, so. that's the thing. So I would have to just. Um, it's always on a Friday, right? Uh yeah, that that group. Okay. We might be able to, to shift it. Yeah, we might be a shift. I would love you to be part, you know, to really get into a whole group of us kind of doing this empathic <laughs> listening. And it sounds that like great. <laughs> I love Mary Gordon. I mean, she is so, you know, tuned into this. I mean, her, her work is just amazing. I think it's really the kind of the best thing out there in terms of the lived experience of empathy. Yeah. So, so um, okay. So if you... I can I can come to one of them. I just have to be able to plan in advance because it conflicts with my responsibilities as a parent. But I do want to try it out. I think it's yeah. Uh, ever since we talked last time, even though we didn't have uh, one of these back and forth formally in an empathy circle, I've been trying, and I think it's it's more beneficial just to actually try it with an expert. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be in a group, you want to really try it in a group where it's kind of like the agreed upon mode of discussion and it kind of yeah. helps facilitate it and get some practice and so forth in it. So yeah, we'll definitely set that up and I'm going to end the broadcast here and